supply chain is, you know, is, is masterful at teaching you. I, you know, I think there's also a people element in there. And, you know, when you are uh, a leader who has to manage from the factory floor, you know, to the board, to the boardroom, you can learn that in supply chain. And I think um, that gives you um, an important, um, I think, empathy, especially in a time like now where empathy and kindness and, you know, how you deal with people, even virtually, is so important. And I think, um, I think it gives you strong fundamentals for, you know, how people, um, you know, how people develop in their career. And I always love the story by, you know, Anne-Marie Campbell. And if you don't know who Anne-Marie is, she's the, she, you know, she leads the, all the Home Depot stores. And, you know, she started out in, in the Home Depot as, <clears throat> as an actual associate, you know, as a, as a clerk. And she learned that business from the ground up. And I think, you know, that's in a way what supply chain does for you. It really allows you to learn mm -hmm. the business from the ground up and gives you incredible uh, credibility. So, you know, I, again, roadmap may be quite different, but um, really good fundamentals uh, in supply chain. And, and you know, I, I would uh, maybe give one more example, and that is uh, Mary Barra of General Motors. And of course, Mary Barra and I were, I spent the first 20 years of my career at General Motors and Mary it was my colleague. Very similar careers. Mary's the CEO of GM and I'm not, but other than that, we have very similar careers. But she, you know, she came up through operations. She came up through the supply chain. She did a, a multitude of roles. Her roadmap was a little different. She ended up in labor relations and HR. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, thinking about customers and people and, you know, the business and financial acumen that you need. So, any, anyway, I, I, I'll stop there, and, and, uh, but that's, that's kind of my perspective on it. Great fundamentals, great foundation. Awesome. I think what I heard you say is your, uh, your background in supply chain um, kind of translated um, and kind of served as the conduit to ensure the future success um, as CEO in Schneider. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so now moving on to the next question, we talked to Tatiana. Uh, Tatiana, uh, so as someone in the strategy and planning of uh, global supply chains at uh, Colgate Palmolive, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into supply chains and um, what are the skills and qualities which have helped you succeed? Hi, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, so always I've been very curious about things, how they work, you know, why, what is the process behind that? So I, I'm I always asking why, you know, even when I was a child, right? They take me to the movies and, you know, nice movie, but I wanted to understand what's behind. How come I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this, right? So I will never stop. And my father was like, okay, so just watch the movie, right? And I'm like, no, but I want to know what's behind, right? So I am always have that in me. But then after I get the why, I start thinking, hmm, how do I change this? How can I make it bigger? How can I make it brighter? So that two qualities of curiosity and always trying to evolve and change has been always with me. And I think that has helped me in the supply chain because supply chain is something that it's always evolving. When you think you implemented something and you're like top of the notch, guess what? A new technology arrived, a new idea arrived, right? So it, it's amazing. And just relating it with my, my, my career, you know, I started in Colombia as a, as a planner and I had a system and I thought it was a good system. You know, I could work with the system. And then I got a promotion. I, I went to Mexico to manage um, planning for the biggest oral care plant that we have. And they were not using the system. They were using Excel. And I was like, wait, so I thought I was going to go forward and now I'm going backward. And that is started to trigger things in me, right? And since I, I always ask you what is going on, what is behind now? And you know, fast forwarding now, I'm the global director of planning and guess what, right? And like, I know how it works because I asked and when I was a planner, I took the time to understand everything and now developing and transforming not only the system because you understand that you can have the most beautiful system, but if you don't have the talent, it's not going to go anywhere and it's not only going having the ta the talent but having that change management and empowering the people right that in, instead of become a good system users they the system work for them right and they become augmented planners right it's decision making instead of op operational 
So I, I think this this path has helped me to be now here and and start um, working in this digital transformation of my area of planning. And what are the next steps? It's awesome. If I could paraphrase one of those, uh, uh, you know, the ability or your willingness to kind of change is especially uh, help you a lot considering, you know, with the current times and supply chain, when everything is changing at such a faster pace, right? Yep. Thank you so much for sharing. That's really insightful. Um, now we're moving on to the next question we have for Monica. Uh, Monica, so why did you choose supply chain? And tell us a few things you have created through digital transformations to enable world-class uh, capabilities for Dell. And how difficult, if at all, as a woman, if, if that has been for you? And uh, can you share some insights from your journey all along the way? Sure. Um, well, I started off my career at Dell in manufacturing software engineering. Um, I had a lot of leadership roles, um, managing software development teams, and I was finishing up an expat assignment in Shanghai um, where I was um, moving or bringing up an engineering organization. And as I was repatriating, that's you start thinking about, okay, what role am I gonna come back to? And that's when I made the conscious decision to move more into supply chain roles. Um, I've had a few roles in supply chain, um, but some of the transformations that I've delivered are um, transitioning, you know, participating heavily in the outsourcing manufacturing strategy that Dell had from engineering perspective, um, you know, partnering with our ODM partners, um, selecting trade tools to start digitizing customs compliance. And then recently, my biggest one is that I'm leading a team that's delivering programs that's going to transform the demand planning organization. Um, difficulties along the way, um, you know, I, I feel like I've been very fortunate that I've had a lot of great colleagues and peers that have been supportive um, along the way. So, you know, I just feel very fortunate. I've had mentors, colleagues that I could, you know, rely on or ask questions on through any of my challenges throughout all the different roles that I've had. But the one thing that I'll say about supply chain and why I really enjoy it is, and I think why it was an easy transition for me from engineering is, to echo some of what Tatiana is saying, it's all about problem solving. It's just what problem are you solving right now, whether it's a process or tool or capability. So um, that's why I like supply chain is that's all you're doing is solving problems. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so moving on to the next question uh, we have for Dina. Mm -hmm. um, Dina, so as the IT director for Corning GSM, um, could you tell us a few things which enable you to success, uh, successfully build a digitally collaborative culture at your company? Absolutely, thanks for having me. Um, before I go into the digitally collaborative culture, I, I wanna say I'm a little different probably than some of the panelists. I came into supply chain kicking and screaming. I was a marketing <laughs> major and a finance major, but my first boss was a chemical engineer and I was in the oil business. So supply chain was everything under refining, marketing, supply, and transportation. So he made me memorize and understand everything from the manufacturing process, chemical engineering process for um, the oil business, right? Because he wanted me to know the whole value stream from manufacturing and supply to supply chain movement. So yeah, he, it was rough. And I think to the other panelists points, what keeps me in it is that it is some of the most complex problems to solve all in one spot because you get to do everything. Um, everything, you know, my first, you know, foray into it 30 years ago, I got to solve problems in our retail network where we had tens of thousands of gasoline stores, problems in the refinery, right? Problems with our global transportation networks. We had very large crew carriers and you get into vessels and problems. Like you get to learn everything to the point where your brain hurts, right? And so then later, I evolved from just being a process and a domain expert, you know, and later in supply chain to how do I digitize supply chain? And so your question on using that experience, that context of the process and the domain and to the work with my partners who are some of the most amazing leaders in supply chain that I've ever worked with and coming from consulting where I've worked for over 30 companies, I have perspective because <laughs> if you, you know, 30 years of consulting before coming into industry, you get to see a lot across a lot of different companies. And so that perspective, along with really strategic leaders that I work with on my business side 
and then my background in technology has kind of really helped solidify me. What, what I love about where we're going with supply chain, you know, the digital part of digital supply chain, just the challenges we face for having real-time visibility, where is my stuff, who has my stuff, what condition is it in, you know, is it stopped at a port, do I have a trade compliance challenge, right? You know, um, everything, the challenges of digitizing everything with, e-invoicing. It's not enough to have paper and email and people doing all this stuff anymore. We can't afford that. We've got to automate. We've got to digitize. We've got to focus on ecosystems. And that's been my journey here at Corning, working with amazing business counterparts to say, how do we do more with less? How do we challenge ourselves? How do we leapfrog? And, and I feel really confident and really um, encouraged with the journey that we're on. We've been very successful with digitizing a lot of our global source to pay operations. We've been very um, successful with, you know, kind of the cutting edge on, you know, trade and compliance and the movement and, and supply chain visibility. And it's a culture shift. My colleagues and I joke that being in digital supply chain is like being on a suicide mission. You know, we're constantly telling people to learn, unlearn and relearn. And they're just annoyed with you, right? <laughs> like, I just got comfortable with this. I just learned this way of doing it. Please don't come with a new process. So, I mean, I, that's why I love supply chain because you never get bored. You get to do everything. And to MS point, you really get to see everything. You get to go deep in manufacturing. People are complaining about consignment or they're complaining about, you know, the vendor managed inventory over here. And you get to go deep in the problems, right? You get to mm -hmm. understand the financial because a lot of our products are index-based, right? And so things are dynamic. It's not static. It's not easy. You've got to be fluid. You've got to be quick. you got to crunch numbers. And you got to know engineering. you got to know everything, right? So like I said, I went into this kicking and screaming. I just wanted to feel comfortable behind my little spreadsheet, do my finance work, do my little nice marketing. And then, unfortunately, I work for, or fortunately, I work for this chemical engineer that says, no, kiddo, you're going to learn it all, right? So... <laughs> So, like I said, that, there's that kicking and screaming journey. You signed up for this versus you were voluntold. Awesome. I think uh, one part of what I heard you saying is, uh, you know, you're translating your experiences from working in the oil industry to, you know, your work at Corning. Uh, uh, but what I also learned from your bio is you spent considerable amount of time in IT services, right? In, uh, yep. And Sun Yang um, and Accenture. So do you have anything or, you know, What's there something if that you could want to highlight one thing which kind of helped you translate your experience from your uh, service industry into what you're doing at Cardening? Do, do you want to share anything on that lines? Yeah, my experiences, you know, in the Accenture's of the world, PwC and EY, is that, you know, I translated because most industries are not single dimensional anymore. Working in consulting where you work in multiple industries and starting in oil, which is technically multiple industries, it's retail. I was just as worried about selling hot dogs and car washes as I was about selling refined oil, right? So that perspective of understanding the complexity that there really is no industry anymore. What is Amazon? It's, it's internet services, it's commerce and trades, it's everything, right? So there are no industry walls. So I would say the most value added thing coming from consulting and multiple industry perspective is that I accept the new reality. There's no such thing as an industry. There's just digital capabilities and services and the ability to evolve quickly for value. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Monica, Annette, or Tatiana, do you want to add anything to that on uh, what you heard uh, Gina saying uh, before we move to the next session? Well, I have a few voluntold stories that we could go into, but <laughs> I think uh, I think that's Dina. I think that all of that's happened in our careers, and I can I won't say who was involved, but I do remember a bottle of wine, and and it was we can drink this bottle fast or slow, but when we get to the bottom, you're going there. <laughs> right? So it um, always starts with I have an amazing opportunity for you, right? <laughs> But you know, you know, I would make the comment that in you know in your careers, um, when when opportunities present themselves, having the courage to walk through them, uh, walk through the door, and take the opportunity is a big part, I think, of what supply chain also teaches you. Many times you're going into situations that are unknowns, problems that need to be solved, and I think you know your descriptions of that, Dina, and you know actually you know, all of our panelists have had kind of, you know, similar examples, right, where you just kind of walk through 
an unknown door. And I think um, supply chain gives you the courage because you know you have the, the chops to go figure it out. Thank you so much for sharing. Monica, you were trying to say something? Sorry. No, no, just agreeing and it's all, I can relate to everything. It, it always starts off with, have you thought about this? You know, or have you considered this? And then that's when you're looking at your boss or a, a mentor saying, okay, where do you want me to go? <laughs> you know, let's just get down to it. But I think Annette is spot on being very open. I, you know, I've had a lot of vast, varied um, experiences from customs compliance, manufacturing software engineering, IT roadmap planning, deploying IT tools, and um, being open to something completely different is what enabled me to you know, broaden my experiences. So completely agree with Annette. Be willing to say yes. I mean, even when you have no idea what you're stepping into. Yeah, so, and, and, and I think that's um, another, uh, I would say, leadership skill that you develop in the supply chain and is being courageous and feeling okay with being uncomfortable. And that's okay, right? I mean, I had many experiences also that, you know, once I was working in logistics and got a call saying that one of our warehouses was not going well, you know, just take a flight and go there. And I'm like, and it was, you know, a country, Germany, my German is not fluent. I, you mm -hmm. know, I speak only Spanish and English. And I'm like, I don't even know how to say good morning in German. You learn. I'm like, good. So next day, took a flight, landed there. And I'm like, dear Lord, okay. Let's see what we do, right? And, and just, you know, ask a lot of questions, break the problem, several pieces, and, you know, work with the team and start solving. And, and that's what supply chain gives you, right? That, that opportunity to do troubleshooting, but I don't only, only that, but being courageous, and then you develop empathy, right? And which is something that Annette mentioned, and then I think it's, it's key, right? You, you need to understand, you need to be in in the shoes of other persons to understand what's going, what's going on. And then you develop that. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. Um, so let's switch gears here. And um, let's start the segment, the second segment, with the most important topic of, uh, of the day. Um, with the current state of the events, and especially with the COVID and the pandemic, uh, supply chain has been on everybody's mind. And I'm sure most of our attendees who are here with us um, have a question of how would supply chains change? Uh, how would the design of, and future of the supply chains evolve? And um, on this lines, so my first question I have for the panel is, in your opinion, how big of a shift are we going to see in supply chains? And what sort of activities are happening in your organizations to enable the shift? You, you, is it an open question or do you want to question? Yeah. Um, anybody well, I, can, I can start. I'm, I know there's a lot of expertise here, but you know, if I could take it at the very, at the very broad level, um, what I, what I see is a, um, what I see is the pandemic has really exposed the, what I'll call fragility of the supply chains. And it's really coming from over optimization. And you think about it, you know, we've over-optimized on labor costs by, you know, moving into low-cost countries. We've over-optimized in factory floor space utilization. We've over-optimized on transportation lanes. We've over-optimized, you know, basically every end-to-end -end aspect, you know, very focused on productivity, lean manufacturing. And I think what's happened now is this over-optimization, really, after, you know, a decade, decade and a half of, you know, lean manufacturing principles has really showed the fragility of the supply chain. And I think all businesses are now looking at, you know, what and how resilient um, can they, should they be, and how much are they willing to spend on it? And there's this concept called, you know, anti-fragile, right? How do you make something more anti-fragile? And you, you do that in the wake of, you know, black swan events that, you know, we're seeing with respect to COVID or um, the pandemic, you know, the, the, the situation we're in now, but not only. I mean, we see climate change events impacting um, supply chains and businesses. And, you know, we also are starting to see social unrest and what's happening, you know, in our country and in other countries 
um, with respect to this. So these are all things that disrupt the very efficient and very optimized flow of our current supply chains. And so, you know, I, I, our teams have been working with uh, Dr. David Simji Levy out of MIT, looking at, you know, time to recover, time to survive, you know, risk and resiliency, and really understanding where we need power of two. Do we need to do more multi-shoring? Are we too dependent on China? So we've been working on, you know, all of these things um, in, the, in the, the ambition to become more anti-fragile in an environment where the events are not even predictable. And that's what we've really been facing over the last uh, six months. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. Um, so Monica, maybe I, I want you to, I have a question for you based on a similar um, thought. So Dell is focused, um, or Dell has a concept of just-in-time manufacturing. It has embraced it in the past. So how do you, how do you see the current state of events affecting the supply chains the future supply chains of Dell? Well, what we're doing right now to, we're in the process of transforming our end-to-end -end planning organization, which is one of the big transformations that I'm leading. Um, and around that transformation is providing the visibility and the transparency so that we can respond to these unknown activities. A lot of times because everything is disparate, not connected, everybody has their own you know, source of truth, it takes too long to respond to any event. So that's what our focus is on digital transformation is, uh, you know, how do we connect everything so that everyone at least has the same data, but more importantly, that you can get the information faster and respond with a plan to address the issue. So to me, it's about being able to, res being able to see the problem in your supply chain faster so you can respond faster, whatever the instance is. Okay, got it. Thank you. Tatiana, do you have anything to say on that? Uh, so uh, very much identify with what Annette and Monica are saying, right? Um, so it's not only, so we started in our company, our, um, let's say, um, transformation before COVID, just before COVID. And then when COVID hit, guess what? We need to go back to the strategy and say, okay, we learned something, right? We learned that um, with COVID, we're not passing off, right? We're not seeing things in the, and I don't call it real time, I call it the right time. Um, because some things you don't need to see every second, it's when it's right to see it, right? And, 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 and so we went back and adjust, and, and we are in that process, and, and that, um, as, as Annette call it, over-optimization, which I love, we, I call it cost-obsessed, but I like over-optimization better, um, has drove us to have one supply chain capability, right? Fast, 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 and, and, and efficient, efficient, efficient. But with all these changes, we realize, you know, one capability doesn't fit all. And also we don't support as we should the growth of the company. So um, I am leading right now the transformation of the segmentation, which I know Dell already did, and 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 and, and it also it was done in your company because I read very good papers about the the segmentation process that you did. So I'm all so I'm leading that, and we're saying okay, it's not only to be you know cost efficient, we also need to be uh, agile, right? So how do we respond better to the to the market changes and what implications that has for our supply chain? But it's not only about our assets. We are also working about the, the, the way we connect with each other, the way we make decisions, right? Even the way we start a meeting. Now we started meetings complete, completely different. We have one slide that says the objective of this meeting is this. This is what we're going to discuss. And these are the you know, decision owners. And only bringing that is new ways of working and has brought a lot of agility to our supply chain. So I think um, COVID, of course, is terrible. No one wanted a pandemic, right? And, and, and a lot of casualties and, and, and it's something that I, we all, all have learned uh, in your professional life and in your personal life. So I think for us, it has injected to our supply chain um, uh, how do we become resilient and how do we transform fast? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Go ahead, Dina. 
Yeah, you know, I um, I guess I would have to reinforce some of the things some of that Annette has said, Tatiana and Monica, um, starting with the anti-fragile, right? You know, we are seeing the weaknesses in our supply chain where we're vulnerable, whether it's because we're not getting the insights fast enough, we're not connecting the dots fast enough, it's too manual, it's too human dependent or what have you, right? And closing the loop on that, right? I, I think, Monica, you really dwelled on that to say it's just the lag is too much. Um, we've got to get the insights um, quicker, faster, um, to kind of pivot. And so we are trying, that's what we're working on is ecosystems. It's, I just think the supply chain of the future is about ecosystems. You have got to get smart enough to know that you can't do everything. You can't know everything. You have to have partners ready to go that are, mm -hmm. and that, that partner, they can't be the weakest link in the chain, right? You've got to make sure that everybody is strongly bonded and ready for this, right? And so that's what we've been focused on. I am concerned about just closing those gaps on you know, human plus economy gaps, right? Saying that how do we enable people to see more insights, not focus their time on the tactical non-value stuff, get to the, the world is moving so fast and the variables that we have to analyze, there's so many of them. And, you know, there's just a lot to unpack and digest. And we want to empower people to be successful and really get to the answer and understand the root cause and pivot as we need to. And then we also, I think, Tatiana, you were hitting on this to say, we need to, and Annette hit on it too, we need to understand on these supply chains, um, you know, it used to be that it was one variable, lowest cost, wherever it was in the world. But now we got to maximize and constrain to two or three variables, lowest cost, but minimally in this region, right? You got to have regional supply chains. You can have some things that are global supply chain. You've got to really think in parallel mode, right? And that is really complicated. Um, and then, you know, as part of the supply chain, what exactly are you selling? I mean, I think a lot of companies are challenged. We still have this product mindset when we live in a services economy and helping even our commercial counterparts understand, okay, what are we really focused on and moving and bundling in the supply chain for value, the products, the services, right? And, um, you know, and the adjacent revenue that comes. You're starting to make money in our supply chain in areas that we never thought, and they may not be core competencies, but the next thing you know, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity, right? And so just thinking outside of the box and not having a checklist culture to say, let me just check, check, check what I've done for the last 20 years and not just really being open-minded around value in the supply chain. Things like supply chain financing, right? If I got to buy from you anyway and I can help architect, you know, let's say, you know, a financial structure that helps you, helps me, right? There's a gazillion things of value in the supply chain that we've got to start thinking differently and not just on the core, you know, product or service, right? So there's between the financial dimensions, between the ecosystem and partnering dimension that you cannot try to do this all by yourself. And then just being brave enough to challenge the assumptions that were true for the last 20 years, but are not true today, right? <laughs> so, you know, that's how I would, I would sum it up because, you know, and the supply chain is first, we have to sense, you right. We have this, these plans, these SNOP plans, and we have a demand plan, and then we have reality of what's trending and what's happening right now and moving right now, and we need to quickly recalibrate, right, and get to the demand sensing truth, regardless of what your salespeople thought, regardless of what your capacity, you know, gives you favoritism around, but like what's really going to make money right now and what's really selling right now. So it, it's just really complex. Supply chain is, it gives you a headache, right, but <laughs> it keeps you engaged, that's for sure. You know, hey, so Gothry, could I could I could I bridge back to, you know, sort of your opening remarks, which were around, you know, you can see supply chain jobs are becoming technology jobs. Right. I mean, this is really a digital transformation. And, you know, I've been fortunate to work with the uh, World Economic Forum on the future of manufacturing and the future of supply chain. And, you know, everything from, you know, how does the workforce change and how does it become, you know, in the face of technology and, you know, we've heard some of that, how you get people to move to a, a new, you know, digital tool or capability, um, but also in, you know, the, the, even the factories themselves, you know, how they were, we, 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 we just announced that our Lexington uh, facility, a 65 year old factory is now a World Economic Forum acknowledged lighthouse factory, meaning it's adopted, you know, all the technology from the fourth industrial revolution. And, you know, if I could brag a minute, it's using, you know, Snyder Electric, you know, technology stack to do that. 
And it, but this is amazing because this factory, a 65 year old factory that probably no young person, no new supply chain uh, person that's interested in technology would ever really want to work in is now a highly digital, highly technical, you know, you can see, you know, you can see what you need to see when you need to see it. Um, these are the factories now that, you know, we're asking people to go work in and you know, we think about the things we're facing, you know, technology really is the answer and the, the digitization of the supply chain of the factory of the planning of the of the, you know, logistics and network design. It's this is, you know, this is all part of it. Uh, I should say, I'm not yeah, read um, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to add to something that Deanna said and then even Annette touched on is as we talk about how we're transforming supply chains, the roles are no longer going to be the same. So you no longer need a planner to be an Excel expert. That is long gone. Now you need what Deanna was saying is how do they consume the information? Now you're going to need much more problem solving, collaborative skills, influencing skills so they can go navigate with sales and suppliers. Um, so that is something that is really huge that is, you know, kind of runs in parallel with us as we're deploying tools. But I think as we continue, as the technologies continue to advance, there's a lot of whole new jobs that are going to be coming at us. And we have to figure out how we identify those quickly. How do we train our employees to get there or start to have to go and search for the right people um, to fill some of these new roles? Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, the, what I was saying earlier was uh, you guys read my mind. My follow-up question to that was, you know, with constraint considering the state of moving from over-optimized supply chains to supply chains or optimized supply chains, are we going to have more opportunities in there? And uh, I guess you guys answer it perfectly. Um, so I'll move to my next question. And Dina, I'll quote you on this since you touched upon this topic slightly about demand sensing and demand planning. Um, so, so demand forecast is very important in the future of supply chains, especially in the fluid environments we are in. And uh, our works at DSEI especially, we keep hearing from companies that the demand forecast is inaccurate at the best. Um, so how do you feel about it? And uh, what are you doing in, with, in your respective companies to avoid this dilemma? Yeah, we actually have a very large team wrapped around this, this very topic to say, how do we improve our, our forecasting accuracy? How do we get time, um, planning to be a lot more dynamic and more sensing? We have some divisions that they sell through distributors and they feel out of touch with the signals, right? Um, and that they're missing the mark in some of their, their forecasts. And then we have other divisions that are largely tied to, let's say a specific industry like automotive and they should be able to see the signals, right? Because, you know, when COVID hit, it was posted, which plants were shutting down, you know, which car manufacturers said, okay, well, I don't need to make a part of the plant, you know, if I'm a part of their bomb assembly, you know, read between the lines, right? So this is an area where I just think that the challenge is, is the seasonal spikes, right? You know, I think we have the good long-term, you know, um, aggregate planning, okay, but it's these spikes that come out of nowhere, how long and when will it, when will it level off, right? Getting to that, I guess the, the term is more SNOE, this operational excellence and just this, this real-time pivot um, and closing that gap. That's where we're struggling. All right, but we got a lot of good people, a lot of good brains on it, but I, I will say it is not easy. And we need to give them the digital tools that are that adept and agile and really makes it transparent and um, connects all the dots. It, it's not easy. It's on a journey and we're just really having to collaborate with a lot of others and, and put our brains together because it's just not simple. Yeah, it's not even simple for AI, right? I mean, we, yeah. I think, you know, probably most really forward thinking supply chain teams are working to try to engage AI in their planning capabilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've lived on both sides of this equation, you know, complaining to the sales team, if you could just give me a better forecast to being in the, that very team saying, holy cow, I wish we could do a better forecast, right? And, yeah. you know, so the supply chain could be more responsive. And the reality is, I think we're never, you know, we may even be in a, a more uncertain time. So flexibility and agility and realizing that we have to plan for what's knowable so that we have some capacity to react to what we can't know. And I think there's a lot about what we can't know. I mean, most companies can't know how they're going to finish the year right now. Most companies can't know yeah. what 2021 looks like. Most companies cannot know these things. They're not really fully knowable. 
So agility, reactivity, flexibility, you know, connecting as many dots as, you know, both um, actually Tatiana, actually Monica and Dina have all talked about. I think these are really, you know, these are really important things. And again, you know, uh, a lot of that, what's knowable, plan for what's knowable is going to come from, you know, this has come from digitization of, of, of planning, which sounds like you're all, you know, top performing supply chains really working on it. Yeah. And, and I build in on that, and I think it, in the demand planning area, it's where you can see the most transformation, transformation with, the, with digital and the system utilization. We have been able to see good results try, uh, segmenting our um, uh, products and focusing in the ones that you know are stable and you can predict using good statistical models and using the system, right? And you can see how the demand plan accuracy goes up for, for those one. And then you dedicate your people on the ground to do that um, a collaborative work with the commercial area for those SKUs that are less predictable, right? So we are fo focusing instead of, you know, trying to figure out uh, the demand of this SKU that we know is very stable, let the system work on that. On, on that. And you can see very quick results doing that. And, but as you're saying, is not good enough anymore, right? And we have been saying supply chain is changing. So now injecting that POS data, injecting that artificial intelligence that I remember in the past, you know, we said, well, I wonder how weather, you know, affects toothpaste. And we don't see a relationship, right? But nowadays, artificial intelligence is not about weather anymore. That's what we used to think, you know, last year, today is like what's happening, what is social, what, you know, what's coming. Um, so trying to connect that, it, I think, is, is, is the next, next step and where most of the companies are working on. Yeah, maybe um, uh, just to, to build on that, Tatiana, if you think about um, planning being obviously it's it's the nervous system of the supply chain right it's really it's really making the critical decisions but I also if I could turn this just a little bit to sort of the customer orientation because you know the reality is you know, let's just face it Amazon has made supply chain professionals lives you know absolutely miserable because now all consumers <laughs> expect things you know, be to be prime delivered to their doorstep, you know, that afternoon. And so this, this makes it really tough on, on supply chain professionals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that we've been able to figure out is that, you know, with these lighthouse factories, we can actually think of them as a glass factory. We can actually see inside the factory. We can see, you know, maybe a panel board spent, you know, too much time in, in wiring, too much time in a particular category. We can begin to communicate with customers that, you know, we may see a half a day delay, a day delay, uh, and and customers, you know, that are that are doing their own planning, they really appreciate this kind of capability. So I think how we're communicating with customers is also, you know, critical in inside this this end to end look. Yeah, I think that's a perfect segue into my next question, and maybe Monica, you can start on this. Uh, so. Uh, I think Amazon has set the bar for customer service really high, um, as you just mentioned, Annette. And uh, in the same time, you know, the customers have evolved. And one of the uh, recent works at DSCI, we started to talk about the profiles for new customers, right? So do you see new customers in your business? And what are their characteristics and how has that been different from the ones you had previously? That's my question number one. And my question number two on the same uh, lines is that, do you think uh, that women have any particular advantage with respect to understanding the needs of the new customer uh, that you can, or you must organize your supply chain around? Um, so first off, just to be kind of funny, I think women can do it all. I think women can do all the jobs in supply chain and be successful. But back to your serious question about are there new customers? I, I don't think there's new customers. I just think their requirements continue to evolve. Um, yeah. With the technologies there, they're the exact example Annette gave. I now expect two day prime delivery, you know, with everything, even though that's how I got my Forerunner Garmin watch today, you know, I expect that as a supply chain, um, you know, someone working in supply chain talking to a, you know, a partner. 
Um, so I think it's more of like, it's, it's still the same process. You have to listen to what the customer's needs are, what their requirements, um, and partner with them on that. On that. Um, they've got a lot of different options now that they're considering. They're wanting a lot more flexibility. Amazon set that bar and, you know, they're, they're looking at end-to-end -end services. They're trying to, you know, consume things differently. So again, I don't think it's just new customers. It's um, new requirements. Um, and I also think what Deanna said about, you know, there's really no product segmentation anymore. Everything is equally the same when you're shipping it. Thank you. Uh, Dina, maybe do you want to comment anything on that? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with, with Monica. It's not that the customers are changing, they're evolving their needs. And I think the challenge is beyond services, they're trending toward outcomes. I want to pay you based on an outcome. You don't sell airplanes anymore. You sell uninterrupted flight hours. You don't sell cars anymore. You sell mobility services on demand, right? And so it's changing our thinking. You don't sell sneakers anymore. You sell a subscription. It's telling you, you run your miles and it's time to change the sneakers and your gait is off. Like you sell personal training, conditioning, coaching, and sneakers. Under Armour does, right? So like understanding what you really sell. Are you selling something based on an outcome or are you in the first generation of a service? But like literally nobody's that product anymore. That's the complexity. Yep. It's a really important point. I mean, I think, um, you know, even in my segment in, you know, in energy management and automation, you know, customers are really thinking about how they spend their CapEx and their OpEx. And, you know, you think about the environment we're in, you know, are we going into a, a lower CapEx environment and the things that Dina mentioned become more and more relevant. You know, we actually have a joint venture with a company called uh, Carlisle. And it's called Alpha Structure. And this joint venture, what it does is it creates microgrids for, for companies that are interested in, you know, driving renewable, renewable energy. But, you know, you don't bring the capital. You just pay per kilowatt hour. So you buy energy as a service. Uh, Carlisle brings the capital. We bring the technology. And Alpha Structure, you know, does the work. And I think that's, you know, that is more and more what we see customers asking for us. So, I would say the characteristics of the new customers that may not be buying a product, but they may be buying, you know, more of a service. And mm -hmm. we, you know, that, that becomes, that becomes different than for the supply chain teams. For sure. Yeah. Thank you so much all uh, for sharing your insights on these uh, really pressing topics. And with that, I guess we could move on to the Q and A. So gentle reminder to all the attendees. So please uh, prepare your questions, post them in the little Q and A space or the chat space, which you find at the bottom of the screen. So we already got a couple of questions. So let me get started with that. So this is question for Dina uh, from Becky Cabell. Uh, so she says, or she asks, have you seen any upstick in using IOT internet of things technology within the supply chain? And what types of opportunities oh. do you see that in that space? Oh yeah, absolutely. That is absolutely critical. That's so foundational. We actually have, you know, when I said you have to answer the question of where's my stuff, who has my stuff and what condition is it in? We actually have sensors on some um, of our assets that are in transit, right? We might need to know exactly where it is. Has it encountered shock on the road? Or has it tripped past a certain temperature? Because we do have live biologicals and things like that in our life science division, right? So there's, there's attributes about that product while it's in motion that we need to maintain. And so IOT data is really important, whether it's just telling me location of where something is on an, on an ocean container or telling me, you know, that, hey, that glass that's on the move just went through two shocks because this guy is driving like a bat out of hell on this road, right, with your product, right? So, <laughs> yeah, it, IOT is absolutely critical because we need it for the signals to get the insights, right, to know where we are, how things are moving, and how things are, because we might have to, at the last minute, you know, push something else to a customer. Something might be in progress on its way to that customer. It's damaged. Now I got to get into the contingency plan, right? And I need that signal to tell me so I get as much of a head start as possible. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And Tatiana, maybe mm -hmm. if you could add something, especially with Colgate Palmer level, there's a lot of consumer goods industry. So how do you embrace the uh, Internet of Things? So one example that we are using Internet of Things is in our manufacturing plants. 
right? So they don't work in silos anymore. So they're completely connected between all the plants. Uh, so we have machines that are either connected with the um, um, uh, suppliers and when they are failing or about to be failed, right? So we're moving from, from uh, to preventive maintenance, they connect immediately and, and the person that is in the plant can, can connect and we have you know, the Google Plants that you can connect and, and you can show how to fix it, how to repair, how to do that. I mean, when I was in manufacturing, you know, 20 years ago and you know, the, the machine broke and we're like, oh, okay, where is the mechanic that knows how to fix it, right? Nowadays, we're all connected. And, and what is, I think, more, more important, sometimes we connect uh, like uh, uh, an oral care plant in Mexico with an oral care plant in Poland, and they share, right? And, and they, can, uh, they can talk and they have all the information in the um, tip of the fingers that it's something amazing that at the end, what brings is you know for us to become more agile and to be able to respond uh, uh, to to issues faster. I think it's you. important that all, you know almost all devices now produce some kind of data, right? Almost everything is connected; it produces data. But the real opportunity is in the insights, um, is in the is in frankly is in the advisory layer of of that and. The technology stack, you know, we've been using is called EcoStructure, but basically it's the connected devices producing data, apps, analytics, mm -hmm. you know, in a cyber secure manner. But, you know, being able to compare the factory, as you said, in Poland to the factory, you know, in another part of the world is really critical in driving, you know, the operating efficiency. And, you know, in this environment where we've probably over-optimized so many things, this, these particular insights are going to become even more and more important. I'm right. stealing that over optimized. Like I wrote it down. I'm stealing that that phrase. I like it. I think if I may sum it, I think it's all about taking all this real time data and Tatiana to a point and using it at the right time uh, to get the best results for your supply chains. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. We have one from Venkai Lee. Let me rephrase this question a little bit. I think uh, Venkai is asking uh, for your recommendation on a good book. Uh, to learn more about digital supply chains. Is there any favorite book of yours which you would like him to take a look at? To be transparent, nowadays, I, and things are evolving so much and so fast that I'm not reading book, I'm reading articles. Every day there is a new article with something about digital supply chain, about transformation, about, I just read a topic yesterday about how a plant can become three different type of plants, right, within itself. Um, so, so nowadays what I'm, what I'm doing is just connecting to um, good uh, repositories of articles, you know, Garner has, Harvard has, McKinsey has, so I think that's how I'm, 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 I'm connecting with digital supply chain and good, good lectures. I'm really following David Simchi Levy uh, of MIT. You know, I've known him for a very long time. I actually worked with him in, in one of my previous roles in companies. I think he's doing some of the most amazing work on, you know, business resilience and how you, how you make these decisions. He's got a case study um, out there on his website with Ford. Um, that he's done on, you know, how to think about, you know, what, you know, what kind of revenue you're risking um, based on maybe where you have a supplier, what that supplier is doing, do you have a backup for that supplier or not? I think, you know, really looking at how do you use the information you have, what information do you need, what needs to be digital, what, when, what and when do you need the information? And I think Dr. Uh, Levy has probably some of the, the best thinking on this from my perspective. And then there is a book out there, and I stole the word anti-fragile from uh, Nassim Talib, who has the book called Anti-Fragile. So I've read that one, and I think it's quite, I think it's quite insightful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The next question. I'm, um, I'm like, Tat yeah, I would like to weigh on that one. I'm like Tatiana, I've been reading a lot more articles, but I'll tell you one book that really got me into the digital mindset is Zero Marginal Cost Society, and just digitalization like that really gets you thinking and then from there you'll go to the living supply chain and some of the books that and that's talking about but i just think those are foundational ones actually i i still go back to a lot of lessons from zero marginal cost society it's really fascinating perspective on digitalization thank you thank you everyone uh -huh. so moving to the next question we have from magdalene 
uh, she says a big thank you to all the panelists uh, for your insights. Um, and her question goes to Tatiana and Monica, and uh, it says, what's your personal view about the supply chain industry and how has the industry changed for women in the course of your career? Hmm. Um, Looks like she's given you a tough question, ladies. Yeah, I mean, as far as how I've seen it evolve, um, I think that why I've been able to um, manage it is number one, being able to, or being willing to try new things, um, being a problem solver, being open to technology. I think that opens the doors for a lot of women with technical um, backgrounds and the ability to problem solve that gives them opportunities in supply chain. Um, that's what I think. I think that more doors have opened that way in that they're looking for problem solvers or looking at people who can get their hands dirty, understand what the problem is and go fix it. Thank you. I, I have seen the evolution, of course. Um, I was, for example, the first woman to be a planning manager uh, in one of the countries I have worked. Um, so I always try and, 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 you know, I look back and I was like, okay, I was the first one, right? So it, it's important that we as women open doors um, in the supply chain and, and, and not only in the supply chain, in any area. So we have a responsibility, right, to open doors and, and, and open them wide, right, to do an excellent work. Um, so the ones that come uh, um, in the next generations um, have a, a good leader and a good career. But I also think about um, uh, what Monica said. It's about being, you know, uh, courageous, and it's about um, uh, having the capabilities um, to and the commitment to do a good work, and that will be recon recognized for sure. And the one thing I will add to Tatiana's comment is that um, I don't think it's moving fast enough with women in leadership. I mean, it's been for many decades where I am the only woman on the executive staff, even today, you know? So, and, and I think how we get there is exactly what Tatiana say, is that all of us, um, you know, really how you change that is you give people opportunities. Hmm. Um, so if you come in, like Tatiana says, delivering results, then, you know, you'll be giving those opportunities. But I don't think that it's been moving fast enough just in my 20 years in the engineering and supply chain industry. I, I agree with Monica and, and I still can see it. You know, sometimes there is a meeting and I'm like, okay, I'm the only one, <laughs> right? Not that I will act different, so, you know, I will still speak up the same that I do all, all the time, right? But, but yes, um, uh, we need to make sure we put most, more, you know, uh, pressure to uh, accelerate. Perfect, thank you. So the next question we have is from Vijay Lakshmi Kadambari. Uh, maybe uh, Annette, I'll direct this question to you since you spoke a little bit about the opportunities. So her question uh, asks, what are the forthcoming opportunities for supply chain in a country like India, which is still in its early stages of ter uh, tertiary infrastructural, infrastructural development? Yeah, you know, uh, it's great. I'm glad you asked me a question about India because actually um, one of the last roles I had, I was, I was responsible for that region of the world. So I, um, you know, I love the country, I love the people, and I love the capabilities. And, and of course, we know that the prime minister has, you know, really focused on manufacturing and India becoming, you know, the manufacturer for the world. And frankly, um, Schneider's been in India for 50 years. I think Dell's, in, Dell's been in India for, you know, probably 25 um, I think a lot of companies have been there a really long time, but had you know, kind of struggled actually, you know, making progress, making, you know, making, uh, actually making money. And, you know, our, our particular presence in India has really come alive in the last decade. Um, and I think there's huge, huge opportunity as they change, you know, some of the um, tax structures that were really uh, an impediment to you know, moving things around the country. And I do believe that India can become a bit the world's exporter as, you know, as uh, costs in China continue to rise and obviously tensions between you know, different geographies of the world continue to change. I think India has a real opportunity to be the winner, uh, frankly, in all of this. And at least from what I know on the political side, you know, talking to you know, the policymakers in 
Washington is that, you know, they're very bullish on India and the long-term relationship between, between the countries. So I think India has, you know, potentially a great decade ahead and great capability. I mean, we're doing, you know, it's, this is not just about, you know, shooting screws and making product. We're talking about design. We're talking about R and D we're talking about, you know, really uh, high levels of contribution to, um, you know, to companies. Thank you, Annette. Uh, so next question we have from uh, Joe Smunoz. Uh, uh, the question says, what needs to be done differently to accelerate um, the presence of women in supply chain roles? Any examples you can share from your experience? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, you were cutting out for me. Oh, sorry. Um, um, am I audible now, Monica? Yes. Yep. Okay. So it says, what needs to be done differently to accelerate the presence of women in supply chain roles? Um, and, and any examples you might want to share from your experience? Well, I could start because I feel like maybe of this group, I've been working on it the longest. Um, and I, you know, I agree with the, I agree with the comments that Monica and Tatiana made that it's, it's really disheartening when you go into a room and you're the only female there. So I think, you know, part of it is about hiring and hiring strategy. And, you know, we have the hiring strategies um, at Snyder to, you know, to have the proper gender representation. And then I think it's about pay equity. And I think this is a really important point because, you know, we know that pay equity is, is critical. So it's about gender pay equity. And then, and then it's really about creating an environment where people can succeed, all people, that it really embraces differences, embraces diversity, you know, racial, gender, you know, um, orientation, it's, it is about creating that culture. And, you know, if, again, if I could brag for just a minute, because I'm really proud of it is, you know, we were just named one of the best places to work in 2020 by Fortune magazine. And it doesn't, you know, it, for, 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 um, for manufacturing and production. So for this category, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't come without work. It comes, you know, it, you have to have a talent strategy mm -hmm. that is really mindful and focused on this specific thing. And you have to have, you know, champions for, uh, for women. Uh, we're engaged in the United Nations He for She campaign. We have many men in our company that are, you know, have overtly said, I am here to support women. I want my daughters to have opportunity. I want women in this company to have opportunity. And they have the discussions like it sounds like a, a mentor of Dina's had with her that, you know, we're really going to pull you out of your current mindset and get you to think more broadly about your overall career. But this is a multi-pronged approach and it starts with hiring, um, honestly. Perfect. Thank you so much, Annette. Um, I'll move to the next question. Um, I guess we partly answered this, so maybe I'm going to skip this about uh, skills needed to focus on learning, uh, but I'll move to a question uh, asked by Mohsen Warse, um, uh, which says, thanks all, uh, and the uh, question goes, uh, when you face tensions and trade-offs between various objectives in your roles, you know, whether it could be financial, environmental, or sustainability, how do you make decisions? For me, it's easy. Take the customer side. Perfect. I, to be honest, I, I've never seen it serve me wrong. And I know that sometimes, you know, you get people thinking about their silo, their function, their P&L, their, their this, their that. And, you know, if you want to take the best side of any equation, take the customer side and you'll always be on high ground. And that's my best advice. So take the customer side. You've heard that. Okay. Um, that's uh, a that's a really loaded question. It's a powerful question, and I agree with Annette. Would you know we're we're challenged with that? Like, there's a lot of social responsibility and sustainability things coming into supply chain now, and so we're balancing the customer side and the extended stakeholder network, right? You know, you start looking at certain things like industrial mining. We know we need certain raw products in our supply chain, and we got to balance, you know, um, future needs for sustainability and social responsibility and what the customer wants today. It is such a complex, loaded question, and it challenges us every day. Awesome. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next question. Uh, it's by Ms. Dian Lau. She says, in your experiences, what were the biggest problems with cross-border supply chain systems and how would they solve with digital supply chains? 
Can you repeat the question, please? Um, so she says, uh, what were the biggest problems with cross-border supply chain systems and how were they addressed or solved with digital supply chains or solutions? Cross-border? Monica is a cross-border expert. Oh, okay. cross-border expert. Yeah, well, I, you know, number one, the problems with supply chain is um, what I've seen in my experience is nothing is connected. Everybody has their own system record and no one's data is the same. Um, so that again goes back to why we're digitally transforming is getting everybody at least looking at the same numbers and the same information so then you can have the appropriate conversations. So to me, the biggest challenge is everyone's in their silos, everyone has their own Excel spreadsheets and it, nothing is easily connected. And, and it's not like people are being, um, you know, purposely not sharing information. It's just not easy to do when nothing is connected and, you know, um, and they're going off their one spreadsheet and their phone call to procurement. Um, so, so that's to me is the, the biggest challenge that we have and why I think it's very important to move to digital to try to get everything into one system of record. And I would yeah, add, I definitely go ahead. Go, go ahead, Tatiana. I want, I want to add on after you. <laughs> go ahead. I will build on Monica. And when we talk about supply chain, supply chain does not start in my manufacturing plant and ends when I deliver the product to my customer. When we say truly supply chain end to end, it starts and not in only my suppliers, it starts in the source, right? And then it goes all the way down connecting all that, as Monica said, it's the key. Are we there? <laughs> not, not yet, most of us, but we're trying to get there. I think that's very important to understand what is end-to-end -end supply chain and bring along our external partners, not only our suppliers, but we have contract manufacturers, we have co-packers, right? Um, so Colgate is a company that has uh, many manufacturing plants, right? But we also have external partners. All of that is the end-to-end -end supply chain. When you start looking at the supply chain like that, that's when the transformation starts. And then digital is applying, you know, digital um, to do that. It's, it's, it's the challenge that we are all working on, right? Yeah. Yeah, I want to add on to Monica's point when she said, hey, it's, you know, there's a lot of players in the ecosystem, whether it's freight forwarders and brokers, nobody has the same digital truth and it's a mess, right? But beyond that, the rules are so complicated that our systems can't even support it. We're getting into trade wars where we have to know, is, you know, is a percentage of that product is the origin from a certain percentage of a certain part of the world. And is it 10% that's China origin or 30%? Like, I don't even have that kind of bomb detail on this stuff to even tell you that, right? So. You know, we're all out of whack. We're all out of compliance. And, and the system that can't even keep up with the complexity of the legislation that people are writing, right? And so that's what I worry about. We, you know, and I actually have a degree in public policy. I need to go talk to my comrades and say, calm down a minute. <laughs> we can't even operationalize some of this stuff, right? That's, that's what trade is, the more complicated area of all the things that I manage because the rules just keep getting complex. Yeah, well, and the and the the technology the technology piece of this because you know because many devices now are smart and many products are smart they're producing data where's that data going does that product have any unintentional functionality do we need a secure yeah. supply chain you know where was that circuit board made who made it this is all you know it's all getting a lot deeper in the in the bomb of any any particular especially an intelligent device mm. so cyber is becoming another angle on all of that. Yeah, I didn't catch the question was around borders, but I completely agree with Annette and Deanna. I've selected and deployed a couple of trade tools, one even at Schneider. Um, but to Deanna's point, things are changing so fast. Even if you're using a very good trade tool, you, you still there's still a lot of work to keep up with the ever-changing um, regulations between countries. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, it's cross-border. I mean, even if you're following the rules, sometimes shipments just get held up. Yeah. You know? I guess, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but we have to end this uh, Q&A. Uh, uh, apologies for some of the questions we weren't able to take, and we are at almost the top of the hour. And I just want to say a few quick things to wrap up. Um, so first of all, again, I want to thank all my panelists uh, for such a great discussion. Uh, I personally feel like I've learned a lot, and there's a lot of food for thought here. Um, and uh, secondly, what I heard and what I want to highlight is uh, supply chains is no more back office operations, right? You know, supply chains have been evolving at um, 
such a faster pace and uh, they've been more important than ever and uh, that enables it or creates more opportunities for us to grab. And finally, uh, I think I just want to highlight one of uh, uh, the research studies by Dave at DSCR, which kind of says, uh, you know, the skill sets in supply chain have been evolving. And I guess I've heard Monica Pierce kind of touch upon that saying, you know, problem solving, influencing, and, uh, you know, all these skills are, have now become important, critical thinking and all this stuff. So I, I believe women have an un untapped advantage, which can be utilized in utilizing these skills um, you know th towards building resilient supply chains and uh, whether it could be employees or employers uh, I think we we got to make the most out of the supply chain transformation through inclusion and diversity with that said um, I think we're almost it's 10 15 ET so just one final comment um, um, so to all our attendees we want to keep this conversation going uh, we will have other initiatives planned we appreciate your feedback. So please, please let us know um, what you would like to hear from our community and us. Um, so you will receive a short survey through the email which you've registered with number one. And uh, we want to continue this conversation or we want you to con continue this conversation using the hashtag women leading supply chains. And um, thank you everyone. Um, I just want to ask Mr. Chris Kane if he, if he wants to leave us with any final comments for the session. Sorry, Chris, for putting you in the tight spot here with respect to time. No, that's quite all right, and I know we're brief. I just want to thank Annette and Monica and Dina and Tatiana for uh, being being with us today. It's great. You didn't have to do it. You made a choice to do it. We thank you for it, and we hope you'll stay connected with us. Um, to paraphrase uh, Tatiana at DSCI, we think we really have a commitment uh, to open doors of opportunity for women in supply chain. So, as Sagathri, thank you, Sagathri, for doing a masterful job of moderation and facilitation. This was uh, organized and conceived of by you and a couple of others, but I wanna thank you for it. Uh, we will have more. This is not an event, this is an initiative. And we, as, as Sagathri said, please send us your thoughts about if you were us trying to create a community of impact and support for women in supply chain leadership, what should we be doing? So please give us your thoughts and we will be in touch. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to the again soon. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Bye.